Yeah. All right. So I want to talk about springs in video games. That's weird. So you may be sat there asking yourself, why talk about video game springs in the first place? And to be fair, that's a very valid question to be asking. But let me tell you, while this may not be something important or even worth talking about, that's not going to stop me from doing it. Springs may not seem like something that's all too related to video games, aside from the obvious platformer genre, but I would argue that some version of the spring has been around since what many consider to be the first home video game, Pong. While not literal springs, the paddles you control in Pong kind of act like a spring in the sense that many springs in video games act. By this I mean that when an object hits the quote-unquote spring, it immediately rebounds or springs off of it. If you don't believe that this is how springs in video games work, well, just take a look at Sonic the Hedgehog, who I think you could very easily argue has some of the most iconic springs and bounce pads in gaming. When Sonic hits a spring, he immediately bounces off of it in the direction that the spring is facing. In functionality, the Pong paddle is the spring and the ball is Sonic. Weird analogy, I know, but hopefully that gets the point across that I'm trying to make. So pretty much all of that just to quickly say that springs in video games long history together. You can definitely argue that springs in real life don't work by immediately rebounding stuff off of them, thus the Pong paddle does not count as a spring, because springs in real life need to be compressed and push stuff off of them, and to that I'd say, it's just a video game mechanic, but I'm also a sarcastic nerd so I'm gonna tell you that you're wrong. While springs in real life tend to not work by immediately bouncing stuff off of them, the science behind springs does not exactly say that that has to be the case. While definitely an extreme circumstance, Blocks of solid concrete can technically act as a spring, just obviously not a very good spring. While I may be a gamer by hobby, I'm a mechanical engineer by study, and something they taught me across almost all of my physics and dynamics courses was this little thing known as Hooke's Law. Now, Hooke's Law is essentially that the force that a spring will exert is proportional to the compression of that spring. Through this relationship between the compression and then the force that's exerted is where we can get what's known as a spring constant. The spring constant is basically the core component of Hooke's Law, and what essentially dictates our typical understanding of how springs in the real world work. This spring constant is also responsible for why we can consider a block of concrete a spring. We don't see it because you don't compress concrete that easily, and since concrete isn't that compressible, it's going to have a very high spring constant, so obviously the force that it's going to exert is near non-existent. But in the world of video games, it can be an entirely different story. Taking a look at those iconic red springs from the original Sonic the Hedgehog game, we can see just how outlandish springs in video games can really be. Using Sonic's in-game sprite as sort of a ruler, we can count how many Sonics Sonic has sent into the air. Since Sonic has a height of 3 foot 3 inches in the classic games, and he has sent about 14 and a half Sonic sprites high, we can get the distance of the spring bounces Sonic into the air as around 47 to 48 feet. This is important to know because we can then calculate the potential energy that Sonic is holding at the max height that the spring sends him. So by using Sonic's weight that's given to be around 77 pounds, the height that Sonic bounces at 47 to 48 feet, and the gravitational acceleration of Earth, we're going to get somewhere just shy of 5,000 joules, or 5 kilojoules of energy. Also, while it may not look it, the spring actually does compress when Sonic jumps on it. It's a very small window, but the spring compresses about half its original height, which comes out to be nearly a foot when using Sonic Sprite again as a ruler. So, using the equation for elastic energy in springs, we can do a bit of simple algebra to find out the spring constant is just really big. Look, I'm tired of doing math and Honestly, the skit's gone on long enough. But if you want to have fun with this and assume that the spring doesn't actually compress at all, by taking the limit approximation of x in Hooke's law, the variable responsible for the compression distance, to be zero, we will see our spring constant approaches infinity. Obviously, we cannot have a literal compression distance of zero because then there is no spring energy or spring constant. But by approximating the limit of the equation, we can see just how illogical springs in video games actually behave. And it makes sense from a gameplay perspective. Of course, there are going to be games that do give compression feedback with their springs, but for the most part, it's better to just allow instant springiness for the same reason that characters in video games jump instantly when you hit the jump button. Have you ever played a game where the character had to bend their knees and push off of the ground to jump? 
most likely not, because the movement would just seem unresponsive and feel really slow if this were the case. Games can break physics and make it seem normal for the sake of gameplay, and that's totally fine, because unless you really take the time to think about it, you're never going to notice, and honestly, no sane person is going to put this much thought into it. Hey, I never said I was sane. There are plenty of different springs in video games, and I have really only focused on the springs that, as I have just proved, act in ways outside of normal physics that we are used to, but there are some games that do implement springs without instant feedback. The Japanese Super Mario Bros. 2 or Super Mario Bros. The Lost Levels has springs that require you to compress before you fly off of them, and while springs are an obvious example of springs in video games, like, oh, of course they are, I didn't have to tell you that. But there are many other examples of springs in video games. Tires, canopies, beds, clouds, and for some reason mushrooms are very often used as springs. I don't know why. Oh, and duh, how could I forget? According to tvtropes.org, we have the legendary boob-based gag spring. I can't say I know of any video games that use this, but I can say that those things are going to break both their spines. What the f- Future installments would refine and focus more on this mechanic, but even all the way back in the original Super Mario Bros. game, most of the enemies even act as a spring. Jump on a Goomba and you'll spring off of it a bit. But of course, most of these examples of springs in video games are going to originate from platformers just due to the nature of the genre. Although, with the expanding ideas in other genres, it is possible to find examples of springs in other games. Something that has slowly made its way into Battle Royale and even first-person shooter games is the bounce pad. Fortnite and even more so Fall Guys both have forms of the bounce pad in their gameplay. Doom Eternal even has bounce pad designs throughout some of its levels. I would even argue that the double jump in some of the Call of Duty games could be seen as a spring mechanic, although I would understand if you completely disagree with that. Needless to say, while far from the most important aspect in gaming, springs are weirdly commonplace in video games, even if you tend not to notice them. They can make for great additions to level design and work towards a fun mechanic for players to mess around with. But if you had to ask me my personal favorite spring in gaming, it has to be in Stardew Valley. I mean, come on, it's such a cozy season. It's what you start with, the music is great, some of the crops are the best, like easily the best spring in video games.